on our last lecture, we looked at different local uh, goods uh, that are provided. And uh, the most important one uh, that we saw was education, the schooling. Um, and so we saw, so some, this is some of the data right here, 5% increase in test scores means a 2.5% increase in home prices, or it's correlated with a 2.5% increase in home prices. We looked at this Bustan paper um, that showed most of the differences between home prices in municipalities right next to each other. So these are houses like literally like right next to each other. The only difference is they are assigned to a different school, school district. There's like an invisible line running between the houses. Now it's usually not right between the houses, but it's like neighborhoods that are adjacent to, uh, to one another. And she, she's, she's able to show in this paper that basically all of the home price differences uh, is due to the, uh, the schools that are associated with, uh, with those homes. So, okay, so in terms of prices, this is a, uh, a very important um, good that is provided or associated with the, uh, with the house, the school quality. And as we'll see later in the lecture, uh, the school quality is also very important for lifetime outcomes. You know, the quality of your school district that you attend when you are a child is incredibly important. And obviously, parents are aware of this. Um, and so it's capitalized in, um, in, the, uh, in the home prices. All right. And so this is some of the data that shows this. Okay. So uh, this shows basically, uh, um, you know, school quality, a measure of school quality in terms of like how advanced the students are is on the x-axis and then how expensive uh, is the housing is on the y-axis. And so what you're going to see in each of these at once is kind of kind of tough to, to, to see the way these are set up, but it's a positive relationship. The more advanced the students are, the higher the home prices. The outliers in all of these will be the center city schools because, so this is San Francisco proper. Um, here we see the schools are of, you know, kind of worse quality to all these ones, but uh, it's more expensive. So obviously the reason San Francisco is more expensive is there are other amenities uh, that attract people to San Francisco beyond the school district. So this has basically a whole host of other amenities that why people like it. Uh, okay, similar relationship in Boston, you know, as we, uh, as the uh, students get better, the uh, home prices uh, increase, similar one in Chicago. Um, okay, so this is like an important, uh, you know, public good. Again, it's not, a, it's technically not a public good, it's a private good by definition because uh, it's excludable and it's rival. Uh, but it has been provided by the government, or it's traditionally in most countries provided by uh, the government. And so, all right, this is important, you know, this important uh, a good that's provided. What makes a good school, or how can we have better schools? I think it's common perception that American schools are poor uh, relative, or poor performing relative to other developed countries. And some of that is true if you look at the test score data. So the test score data, US students tend to not score as well as peers in comparative uh, high income countries. And so why are our schools bad? I think one of the common answers is we don't spend enough money. If we just spent more on schools, uh, we would have better outcomes, okay? And this is one of the misconceptions that, okay, we need to spend more on education. Now, we don't spend that much. We'll see that this, this, this is a misconception. Another misconception is, okay, well, why are these schools so good in the, um, you know, in, uh, in the rich neighborhoods, in the high-income neighborhoods? Oh, well, local taxes pay for schools, and so these schools have more money, therefore, uh, they're better. And so underlying kind of both of these is that, okay, the reason why, uh, you know, the U.S. does so poorly on these tests is we don't spend enough on education. And the reason why you know, rich uh, uh, school districts in upper income neighborhoods are better is because they have more money to work with. And so underlying both these misconceptions is the idea that if we just spend more on education, automatically school quality and student outcomes go up. That there's like a high correlation between how much we spend and how well students do. So all of these are not like patently false, uh, but the reality is much more uh, nuanced, okay, and so we'll get into this. So prior to 1970, it was indeed the case that financing was local, 
that local property taxes paid for the schools. So if you have a neighborhood with more valuable housing, um, then those schools did have uh, more money. However, after 1970, this really uh, changes. So there's lots of different reforms. There's reforms coming from the judicial branch, coming from the legislative branch. Um, but the end result is a equalization of spending on, uh, on schooling or schools coming between rich and poor neighborhoods coming close to parity. So all of this will come from a uh, Jackson Johnson Prisco paper. Um, and so here we can add, this is the type of different reforms. We have court mandated reforms, essentially saying, look, you need to spend more on your low income districts. We have legislative reforms. And then we have a, just adjustments to formula in terms of how funding is provided from the state to the uh, local districts. And all of these will lead to more funding for the low income uh, areas. So here, if we start back, and you can see this, so here, if we start back in 1968, uh, no, sorry, 1967. We can see the differences. Okay, so here is your top 10% versus your bottom 10%, and then uh, some other ranges. And so we can see the per pupil spending does indeed look very different. Okay, there is this gap. However, if we fast forward to 2010, we've largely uh, caught up. This gap has uh, significantly narrowed. And in fact, this bottom 10%, the poor neighborhoods in 1967 actually get more money than the whole middle income range uh, right here. So we've brought the poor districts above all the other districts except for the top 10%, and we've largely closed that gap via all these uh, reforms. Now, this may be different in some places, uh, but on average, we've reached parity in terms of spending between uh, low income and high income districts. And the other thing you'll notice about this graph, this is all, this is not just, this is all, these are all adjusted for inflation. And so, you know, we've gone from spending, you know, somewhere around 5,000 per, per pupil to upwards of, uh, of, 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 of 12,000. So we've more than doubled. And in many cases, we've tripled the amount that we spend on education. So this idea that the U.S. doesn't spend or hasn't, hasn't allocated money to education is just patently false. We have vastly increased our spending uh, on, uh, on education uh, over time. All right, this is just another way of looking at this. We have this boost after the reform to the low uh, spending uh, districts. Okay. So, you know, going back to our... Uh, some of our misconceptions, the U.S. doesn't spend much on education. So we do. We do spend a lot, and we'll, I'll get to the figures later, but actually we spend more than almost every other developed country on a per-student basis. So we've increased our spending uh, drastically, and we actually spend more. Uh, the, we've reached parity between the wealthy and poor neighborhoods, or close to parity, um, in terms of how much these school districts uh, receive per student. We'll deal with this last one, um, when we get to uh, this question. So what makes a good school? So we're thinking about, you think about like, this is like the education production function, okay? Like uh, the outcome is how well students are doing. What are the inputs? Well, there's resources. You know, how the school facilities, you know, books, technology, tablets, whatever the, the students are getting. So that's one input is, okay, the resources that these students are, are, uh, are, are getting. Another input is going to be the engagement of the parents, like engagement of your fellow uh, parents, and also, and that's going to be related to peers. Like, what is the characteristics of the people you go to school with, the other students? What are the spillovers? So input one would just be money. Input two is the other students. And that's related to like how involved their parents might be. And then of course, input three is the teachers. So all of these things are gonna influence how well a student does. The resources, their peers, and then uh, the teacher. And we wanna think about like, okay, which of these inputs are most important? Now obviously there's gonna be some interaction between them, but if you're just thinking about this, like just do a thought experiment about like what type of school would you like to go to? Like if you could just have two of these three, so imagine a school that has no resources. It's in a barn, barely has like paper and pencils, but 
the other students are of very, very high quality. They're engaged, um, they're very smart, and you have great teachers. Or you could have, say, you know, lots of resources, lots of money, fancy facilities, great iPads. Other students are disruptive, other students are, uh, um, you know, not, go not good. Um, but you have high quality teachers. So it's like, if you could pick two of these, like which two would you pick? And you know, just with that thought experiment, you could kind of come up with your own preferences as to what you think are the most important. Now, of course, ideally, we would like to have all three, but if you could just pick, pick just two or pick just one, uh, you know, which of these do you think uh, is the best? I mean, that's just a thought experiment for you to do. If this were like a real life lecture, we would do it uh, in, in class. Now, what we're gonna do is look through the research to tell us what does the research say in terms of the relative importance uh, of these factors? Like, how do we make uh, a good school? And if we know how to make a good school, what are the barriers stopping us from upping our, uh, uh, um, our school quality? Okay, so one, let's look at resources, all right? So this is super contentious, very contentious about the link between how much we spend on schools um, and what are the student uh, outcomes. Okay, so there's a recent paper, this Carabbo Jackson paper uh, uh, and his co-authors that kind of overturned a lot of previous research that said there was like no link. And so he finds, you know, some link between uh, spending on schools and outcomes. Essentially, he has a better identification strategy for uh, looking at school, uh, school spending and outcomes. And he does find that, okay, there are positive effects that, you know, uh, places where they spend more money, the schools, the students stay uh, uh, in school longer, they earn higher wages, there's lower incidence of um, uh, poverty for these students later on in life. However, all of this, all of these effects are only for low income students. So it seems like spending matters for low income students, but once you reach a, per, a certain point, um, you don't get much more uh, returns. So in econ speak, this is diminishing marginal product, uh, productivity. That you know we get initial bang for our buck, um, but once we reach a certain level, uh, we don't get much more uh, returns. Additional dollars don't do much. Okay. Yeah, there are other evidence that finds a little correlation. Um, so these are these like Pullman, and then there was a bunch of Hannah papers as well that generally shows there's not much of an effect on spending um, and, uh, and outcomes. And then we could think about our just aggregate correlations. So I think in the recent year, uh, the US spends about 15 grand per student, whereas the rest of the developed countries on average spend about, sorry, this is 2011 data, about 9,000. And yet we do worse than uh, these other countries. And also, we've seen our spending increase threefold from 1960. And so as we've increased spending, we have not seen an increase um, in how our students have done. So it was kind of like two aggregate cor correlations that are showing no effect, where the US spends more but doesn't do better on tests. The US increases spending uh, you know, very significantly back half of the 20th century and did not see a concurrent uh, increased in, uh, in test scores. Okay, so here we have, this is the cross country data. So this is the PSI mathematics scores. Um, and uh, here is uh, uh, spending. And so there does, this, there's a weak positive relationship, but it's fairly weak. And then this is uh, changes. When a country increases their spending, do they see an increase in the uh, math sc score? Again, not much of a uh, relationship. Okay. So what is going on? So it doesn't seem like on the, in the aggregate correlations that there is much evidence for an increase in spending leading to an increase in outcomes for students. Now, obviously things are much more complicated than just looking at raw uh, correlation. There's lots of other things going on. The US in many ways has a more challenging population to educate than other countries. So the US gets a lot of immigrants from low income countries you could think that these, these, these students are coming from low education backgrounds. That's a difficult population uh, to educate that other, many other countries don't have. Um, also, it, just, it could be, and we'll see later, is that the US, while it spends more, it's not, it's not how much you spend, but whether 
uh, how you spend that money. And so we could be spending uh, inefficiently. If we look at the why the US increased its spending over the back half of the 20th century and did not see an increase in outcomes, well, there's lots of other factors at play. So we have you know, a, crack, a crack epidemic and the violence associated with that in the 80s and 90s. We have uh, white flight, increased segregation during the first part of that period, um, which may increase uh, incidences or concentrations of poverty. Um, and it may just be that we kind of reached the point where we would see any sort of, uh, you know, any sort of uh, increase in, um, uh, in, in, in outcomes. We've already kind of, we've, we've, you know, we spent our 10,000 and above 10,000, we don't see much, uh, much difference. So you can think about this, like how much money, like if you go from making, you know, 10 grand a year to say 150 grand, you know, you're going to feel so much better. You're going to be happier. But, you know, if you go from 150 grand to 160 grand, it's not going to make a huge difference in your life. Like at some point, you know, above, above a certain threshold, you know, money may start to not matter as much. And so we may have hit that point um, in the U.S. So for a variety of reasons, oh, and also over time, while we spent more on uh, students, while we didn't see test score increases, we did see, you know, other increases in terms of uh, less, uh, less, less poverty for the students that go on to, uh, to, finish, uh, to finish their education. Anyways, the point is, it does not seem as simple as spend more money, get better outcomes, um, based on the aggregate data and the totality of uh, the research. And you know, especially given that we already spend more than other developed countries. So we already are spending 15 grand, they're spending nine grand. So it doesn't seem like if we just throw money at this problem, um, that we'll be able to increase our, our test scores or our student or other student outcomes. Rather, it seems that maybe we should, um, you know, spend this money in more efficient ways or think about how exactly uh, this money is spent at the, uh, at the, local, at the local level. Okay, so let's move on to teachers then. Okay, so what is going on with teachers? Do teachers make a difference? So in the first part, we looked at resources. It's unclear whether resources make a difference, or at least it seems like maybe we're already spending enough on, uh, you know, at a peer pupil level. Um, so resources do not seem like a good avenue to increase school quality. It doesn't seem like if we just throw more money at this, we're gonna get better quality. What about teachers though? So how important are teachers? This is a fun question to ask when there's actual students. How valuable is a good teacher? Like if you had to put a dollar amount on um, the value of what a teacher provides, like what is that, uh, what is that dollar amount? So there's actually research on this and it's about $1.4 million. <laughs> so a good teacher is worth a lot. Now this is from a Chetty paper, uh, Chetty and his co-authors. And what they're able to do, they have a very, very rich data set. So Chetty is kind of a pioneer of using incredibly uh, rich data sets where essentially what they have is student data. So they have data on students, um, how they performed in school. Um, they can link that to their teachers and they can discern whether they had a good teacher or not. And then they can follow up with adult outcomes of those uh, students. So it's like basically they have like the whole scope of a person's life from when they were a student to when they were an adult. They're able to match that to the teachers they had and they're able to get a causal, essentially a causal estimate for the impact of a teacher on that person's later life outcomes. This is just an incredibly rich uh, data source um, that Chetty and his co-authors were able to, uh, to use. Here are the co-authors, just so I don't forget them, Friedman and Jonah Rockoff. And so what they find is basically one standard deviation improvement in teacher value added, that is their proxy for teacher quality is uh, teacher value added. We'll talk about that and what that is in a little, uh, a, a, a little bit. So basically if I increase the quality of your teacher by one standard deviation, your earnings will go up by about 1%. So where do they get that $1.4 million is essentially if we replace a teacher whose value added is in the bottom 5%. So if we replace a bad teacher with a, uh, a teacher from the middle, an average, 
an average teacher. So we just remove a bad teacher and put an average teacher in that classroom. Um, the increase in lifetime, in lifetime income for those students in that classroom would be about $1.4 million, all right? You know, uh, if we put that in present value terms, it's $250,000. So that just that is just, you know, replacing a bad teacher with an average teacher will basically get us in present value terms, $250,000. That's a very large number, all right, in terms of the value. And this is average. This is not going from, you know, a, a, a very bad teacher to the best teacher. This is just replacing a bad teacher with an average teacher. So this paper shows that teachers are incredibly valuable. They can have huge impacts on, on students. And of course, if you think about it, like if we just think of like the, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe your educational experience is different, but like, you know, how nice my high school was didn't really matter that much. How nice the pool was, how nice the gym was, computer lab, what I had access to. What mattered a lot was the quality of the teachers. You know, I can list high school teachers that had significant impacts on me. How this teacher changed my life. How this teacher got me interested in this subject or this, this country. This teacher led me to want to travel. This teacher, you know, sparked an interest um, uh, in physics or really helped me uh, in physics. Actually, interestingly <laughs> enough, I had, even though I have a PhD in econ, uh, I had the worst economics teacher. It completely turned me off uh, uh, to, to economics. I actually didn't, didn't even take an econ class while I was in graduate school. Um, but you can point to teachers that really have uh, this, this, this uh, uh, incredible impact. And this is reflected in the research where we're not seeing a huge, obviously we don't know, we, we want the school buildings to, you know, to, to not crumble. Uh, you know, we, we need some base level of spending on these, uh, 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 you know, on schools. Uh, but really is what, what's making a difference is, is, uh, is the teachers. All right, so how do we know what the good teachers are? Now, this is a very tricky, this is a very teacher, uh, uh, this is a very tricky, um, tricky question. Because, okay, we know good teachers matter. So then we may say, all right, here's what we should do. Good teachers matter a lot. Why don't we just pay the good teachers more? This is very tricky because it's hard or it's difficult to figure out, well, how do we decide what the good teachers are? Now, what Chetty, uh, Friedman, and Rockoff did is they used value-added scores. And this is very popular in the literature to use a value-added score to rate the teacher. Um, and basically what it does is it controls for everything. So you, you run a regression, essentially controlling for everything you, you, you can control for. You know, you're controlling for um, you know, uh, a student's what they scored on a test in the, in the prior year, you're controlling for race, ethnicity, you're controlling for gender, you're controlling for uh, aid, their age, you're controlling for uh, their behavior, suspension and absences, you're controlling if they repeated a grade, you're controlling, uh, you're actually, actually there's another control here with this free lunch, which is a, 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 a proxy for poverty. So you essentially look at the student and you attempt to account for all the observables, including what they got in the previous year in, on a test. And then what you want to look at is how much does their test score go up? And this is how we rate a teacher. How, how good are, teach, are teachers at increasing the test scores of their students, controlling for all these, uh, these factors? So it's not the case that, okay, I'm a teacher and I got a bunch of good students, so I look better on this. No, it's how much are you able to increase their score, um, controlling for all these factors. And we call this a uh, value-added score for a teacher. And this is one method of rating how good uh, a teacher is. All right, so what are the pros of using these value-added ratings for, uh, for, um, for teachers? One, they're objective. So it's just, you know, it, it's, it's blind in essence. It doesn't know anything about the teacher. Um, it's not based on if the teacher is friends with the principal, if the teacher like drinks beers with the principal or, or something like that. Um, so it's not, you know, subject to, I don't know how much you can hear of my son having a great time downstairs, but I apologize. Um, so there is a, so it's, it's not affected by, you know, whatever politics within a school. Now they are correlated though with the principal's subjective rating. So if you ask a principal, what are the good teachers are in your school? 
the principal answers, you know, she answers this, this, this person, this person, this person, they are highly correlated with that. So they do seem to be picking up, you know, some local knowledge, but most importantly for us, they're highly correlated with later life outcomes. So if you have a good teacher as rated by this value added rating, you seem to do better off later in time. Also, these scores are stable over time. So we would be sus we would be suspicious of these scores if you know one year it said a teacher was good, another year it said the teacher was was bad. Teachers tend to, you know, if they're good, they are good. If they're bad, they're bad. It's rare that teachers kind of move around um, you know, uh, in you know, their their quality. And this is reflected in the scores. So there's lots of good reasons to use these scores. Like these scores are correlated with things we we care about, students' later life outcomes. They're correlated with subjective ratings, you know, what, what the principal says, what the, which teachers are good. Um, they're nice and objective. It's a nice one number. So what are, uh, sorry, what are the issues? The issues uh, with them is that teachers hate them, okay? Teachers absolutely hate them because obviously you're a teacher. You think you're doing lots of things. Um, you don't like to think of all you're doing is increasing test scores. That's like not, you know, obviously you don't get into teaching to just raise test scores. So it's essentially collapsing everything you do down to um, one number. So as a teacher, you, you, you hate it. Um, however, you know, a proponent of these scores would say, well, okay, look, obviously you do more than this, but all the things you do, all the good things you do are correlated with this value added rating. Um, and so in essence, it's picking up, you know, all those other things you, could, you do. It's like GDP. Like GDP for a country just measures the size of the economy. Um, it's not supposed to measure anything else, but oftentimes we'll use GDP um, to kind of rank a country or see how, see how well a country is doing because it's correlated with, I mean, this, we, I do this in intro, but GDP is correlated with happiness, it's correlated with life expectancy, it's correlated with life satisfaction, it's correlated with environmental quality, um, it's correlated with uh, essentially everything, it's correlated with education rates. Um, morbidity. And so it's like, it's, it's correlated with everything we might care about. And so the proponents of value added ratings will say, look, it's not supposed to, uh, you know, it's not supposed to do everything, but it's correlated with all sorts of things that we might care about. That being said, teachers absolutely hate them. So in 2010, the LA Times published value added ratings for uh, all, LAU, all LAUSD teachers. And like the teachers marched on the LA Times uh, building. Um, the other issues with these value added ratings is they can be manipulated. And so, you know, I can do things like, okay, I know I have a student who is bad on the test. So I'm going to have him stay home on test day. I could teach the test. Um, I could actually go in and change my students' scores. If I know that I'm going to be ranked on how well they do on test, well, I have incentive to, you know, change, change their scores. Um, and actually this, uh, this paper by Jacob Levin finds evidence of that. Um, and kind of all of these boil down to this famous concept, or I think it should be more famous, and I think it is becoming more famous, but it's this great concept called Goodhart's Law, which says when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. So value-added value added ratings might be able to be a good representation of teacher quality until teachers know that they are being evaluated on this metric. Then they will game the system to, um, you know, to, to make themselves look better. It's like, if I knew, you know, if I knew that I was being graded on, or I was being evaluated on how my students grades, well, I'm gonna be much more lenient and grading. I'm gonna give everyone A's. Like once you know the metric by which you're being evaluated, you are gonna adjust your behavior or game your behavior to score highly on that metric. And then the metric ceases to be a good metric of what we're trying to gauge. Um, and this is called uh, Goodhart's Law. So if a teacher knows that, hey, you're gonna use value added ratings, well, I'm gonna make sure my students do really, really well on the test and in ways that may not, are not correlated with me being a good teacher. Um, all right, I'm sorry, this is another one. No one to go back to. Okay. And so this shows the validity of using these value added um, uh, scores and so what we can see is um, this is this is we can see a score jump when a high value added teacher enters a school or enters a grade we can see the score jump 
um, when, uh, when, uh, uh, when they come. So this is again, this is again a good, uh, just showing that value added ratings are, are, are potentially good metric to evaluate uh, teachers. Here's just a funny way of doing Goodhart's Law or a, uh, 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 um, an illustration of it. So if you measure people on the number of nails they make, if they say, hey, I'm gonna pay you on how many nails you produce, well, then they have the incentive to produce maybe tiny nails. If I say, hey, I'm gonna evaluate you on the weight of the nails make, you make, uh, they may just produce a few very large unusable nails. And so, you know, this is just showing, this is just a funny illustration of, you know, when you know how you're being evaluated, you will game your behavior such that you score well. Um, the most tragic incidents of Goodhart's Law was in the Soviet Union, fishermen were mandated to supply um, a certain amount of fish per year in terms of tonnage. So what do the fishermen do? They, they, they were supposed to provide, you know, a certain amount and tonnage of fish or whatever, seafood, um, and, you know, with no regards to quality of the seafood, it's just tonnage. So what they did is they just killed whales. So the Soviet Union, the fishermen there killed tons of whales just to satisfy the tonnage because it was the easiest way to satisfy the tonnage requirement. And this led to decimation of, uh, of the whale population. It wasn't pe they, people weren't even eating these whales. It was just to satisfy uh, the tonnage requirements from the centrally planned uh, government there. Okay, so we have these value-added scores that we can look at to gauge teacher quality. Um, now, they have these drawbacks, um, but they're potentially a good place to start. Or they're potentially like, okay, we know that they have these drawbacks. We're not going to use them completely, but we may take them into account. That's kind of like an LMU. They know that student evaluation of teachers have all sorts of problems. Um, but you know, it's just an extra piece of information that we may uh, use. Um, other ways we could do this, or other ways we can ascertain teacher quality is subjective ratings. So we could ask other teachers who they think the good teachers are, we can ask students, we can ask principals. Now again, these may be subject to politics or who gives for the students, who gives out better grades. But the thing is, when you go into any institution, you think about LMU, think about the econ department, if I were to ask the students in the econ department, what are the good teachers, what are the bad teachers? If I were to ask the other faculty, who are the good teachers, who are the bad teachers? If I was to ask the chair, who are the good teachers, who are the bad teachers? If we were to write down a list. I would be willing to bet it would almost be a one-to-one -one correlation. Like we all know who the good professors are. We all know who the bad professors are. And all I'm saying, or all the point of this, is like it's very difficult to come up with a fair rating system but at the end of the day, in most institutions, again, it's not, you know, it's not gonna be perfect, but in most institutions, there's a way of ascertaining who the good teachers are and who the bad teachers are. And so this may be a place where we can, if we are able to reward the good teachers, um, this may be a, a, an avenue by which to encourage better teaching or attract better teachers um, and therefore increase student outcomes. Um, and yet, we don't do this, at least at the, at the public school level. Essentially, how much teachers are paid are totally unrelated to their quality. Whether they're laid off or not, and whether they get pay increases, quality of their performance has nothing to do with that. At the public school level, how much you get paid is determined by experience and whether you have a master's degree um, in teaching. And yet, both these things, when we look at, do these things relate to teacher value added, experience, and having an advanced degree? There's no relationship. So in terms of actual student quality, or actual, actual teacher quality, experience and advanced degrees do not increase teacher quality. There's no correlation. And yet, this is the thing that is determining um, their pay. Um, so essentially, all methods that we might use to reward good teachers or to fire bad teachers are blocked by teacher unions. Teacher unions are advocating for teachers, um, not students, so they're advocating for teachers. Um, and so their goal is to you know, make sure that you know, the teachers are protected. And they also 
you know, generally want pay to be equalized between uh, the teachers. So ultimately, this is, you know, what's good for uh, the teacher body. Uh, but it has this, um, you know, it has this uh, perverse uh, effect where bad teachers are, uh, are, are protected. And teachers that are good are blocked from uh, receiving uh, higher uh, pay. So there's no pay for performance. Um, instead, as I said, the way you get higher pay is by having more experience and um, getting an advanced degree, even though that does not relate to teacher quality. Um, it makes it very difficult to get rid of a bad teacher. Um, and many teachers get tenure after just a few years in the, in the school system. So after you've taught for a few years, it's very hard to fire you. Um, and so, you know, the end result is, and then when layoffs do happen, uh, the unions typically require that it's the inexperienced teachers to go first instead of the poor quality teachers. And so ultimately what happens is teachers essentially get paid the same. The good teachers don't get paid more. So there's not really incentive to, for good teachers to stay in a district or to retain good teachers. Um, and firing, getting, getting rid of bad teachers is, uh, is very difficult. So even though we may know who the good teachers are and the bad teachers are, it's hard to get rid of the bad teachers and it's hard to reward uh, the, uh, the good teachers. Okay. And so this is different where um, schools are not subject to uh, the teacher unions. So at private schools and charter schools, they do a much better job of improving teacher quality and their methodology typically is just, they don't retain the low quality teachers. So, you know, a teacher after one or two years, if they are not uh, of high quality, if they, if, you know, using value added scores or using other, other teachers observations or other students re, uh, um, responses, you know, they typically just don't retain uh, low quality teachers. The LMU does something similar where, you know, if you first start here at the, as an instructor, you know, you're under a lot of, um, scrutiny your first couple of years to see how well you're performing as a teacher. Um, and if you're not performing well, they typically don't retain you. With tenure track professors is a little different. Typically, there's just a lot of investment in try trying to turn teacher tenure track professors who are bad teachers into good teachers. Um, but this is certainly something that, that LMU does uh, pay attention to. Okay, so teachers matter a lot, but given the institutional setup, um, it's tough to um, improve their quality. Um, all right, let's, last thing we wanna look at is other students. What, are the, what is the effect of other students have on um, you know, a student's performance? This question, oh sorry, so there's a bunch of different ways that you know, there might be peer effects. So one is networking, so you know, other students, um, other students um, you know, may, you know, have access to uh, different opportunities, um, and by knowing them, that might help you. You know, uh, if you see everyone else working hard, that may influence you, all right? So I think we talked about this class, like in cities where people walk really fast, um, that spills over to everyone else, and that's where everyone else starts walking fast. So, you know, if you're in a classroom where everybody is, you know, really working hard, you're more likely to work hard. If you're in a classroom reverse, where everyone's slacking off, you may also slack off. Obviously, there's skills and knowledge spillovers. If someone else knows how to do something, I can ask them, they can help me out. There may be other types of non, like non-cognitive spillovers in terms of, okay, that person is into, I don't know, programming, and that makes me interested uh, in programming. That person you know, studies, um, or that person you know, has, does an after school activity, maybe I'm gonna get into it. So there's, you know, there's potentially huge effects of peers, lots of spillovers. Now, the, they're very difficult to study because, you know, it's not, it's difficult to do a randomized uh, experiment where you say, hey, we're going to put this student with bad peers, um, or we're going to put this other student that had similar with good peers, and we're going to see, uh, you know, what happens. Like, try getting that past, you know, institutional review board or to the parents. Hey, we, we want to do an experiment on your kid where we're going to put them in the bad, with, with a bunch of bad kids. So, see how well that goes. Um, now we do have some, there is some random variation, you know, so some schools, when they decide to allocate students to uh, classrooms, some students, some schools do it randomly. So, you know, you think about, I don't know what your elementary school is like, but at big elementary schools um, and big middle schools, they will have, uh, well, typically, I guess you change classes in those, but in elementary schools, like typically they may be like three third grade classrooms. 
or you know three fourth grade classrooms and so how do we allocate the students to those teachers some schools do it randomly and so that if, when, if the school if the school does it randomly that gives us some uh, ways to measure the effect um, but in general what's tough is there's selection bias even into the schools and also there once the, even if there's random allocation across teachers there again may be some selection bias like the good teacher may be able to advocate to get the good students or parents may advocate to get their their kid moved into the good teachers classroom um, and this is difficult to observe you know this happens all the time but it's difficult it's not like there's oftentimes documentation of it um, so this is just a very hard thing to look at and also it's like we don't, the effects of spillovers may be non-linear so what we mean by that is like okay if i have a lot of high achieving peers that may matter if i myself is high achieving or it may matter more if i'm higher achieving or it may matter less if i'm higher achieving so it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one effect where if i have a bunch of high achieving peers that's going to affect um you know someone with low test scores the same as someone with high test scores you know similarly like a disruptive student you know, uh, you know, may neg negatively affect, may, may negatively impact the class, depending on the composition of that class. So this is just a very, very difficult thing to research. And so we don't have as many concrete answers on this front as we do, say, the teacher quality front. Like we know good teachers matter. We absolutely know good teachers matter. We know that they have huge effects. Pure effects are harder to get at. Okay. Now that being said does seem to be some there does seem to be some takeaways from the literature and that it seems that high ability students really benefit the most from having high ability uh, peers and they suffer the most from having low achieving peers so high achieving students seem to do much better if they're put with other high achieving peers and they really really suffer if they're put with uh low achieving peers so you know it seems like high achieving peers pushes them further low achieving peers they really really scale back um, their uh, their effort level um, at the college level so the college we get a little bit more random assignment because of the dorms so you know when students come into the dorms like there's lots of random assignment um, where you know typically you know you're randomly assigned to uh, a roommate I don't know how it works at all you but certainly when I went to UCLA you were totally randomly assigned um, there at the college level there does not seem to be much of a peer effect on academic performance, but there are large effects on uh, uh, um, on, on like social uh, activities. So you know, students are much more likely to be in a fraternity or sorority if their roommate is. They're much more likely to drink more if their roommate drinks. Their political opinions are uh, influenced by their roommates um, as well. So on the social level, there does seem to be a lot of influence on peers, but at the academic level, not uh, as much. Okay, so going back to our education production fund function, we have these different inputs, funding, teachers, peers. Funding, we summarized, we spend a lot on education. Um, we probably, instead of spending more, would do better to look at how that money's spent. We know teachers do, we know, we know teachers have a huge um, positive effect, but as we mentioned, because of the difficulties with the union contracts, it's hard to uh, get good high quality teachers, or it's hard to get rid of bad, bad quality teachers. Peers probably have a significant effect, but this is a harder one uh, to, uh, to capture. And in terms of a public policy standpoint, it's difficult to think of what exactly is the public policy um, when we're dealing with peers. What kind of schools are typically well, not necessarily. I mean, I guess schools are not necessarily stuck with the students. You could you could think of, you know, based on the research, maybe more magnet schools would be better, more student tracking uh, would be better, although these typically tend to be unpopular um, politically. All right. Other topics that we didn't uh, uh, explicitly touch on uh, is early childhood education, um, which has huge positive effects. So there's lots of good research, uh, you know, a lot of it by James Heckman. Or he's a big proponent of this, showing that early childhood education, we're talking about education prior to kindergarten, has very, very high positive return. So this is something that we're, that we're not going to go into specifically, but is, is, 
is, you know, it's, there's a lot of bang for the buck in terms of dollars spent here. Charter schools are obviously a contentious uh, topic, essentially school choice, like allowing parents more decision making. Charter schools are not subject to that teacher unions, so they are able to, you know, do certain things that public schools cannot, which makes them uh, a subject of criticism. There also are uh, people criticize charter schools for essentially taking the good students away from the public system. Um, but essentially, it's just more choice. Essentially, charter school just allows parents the choice. Should, can, I, I, can I put my, do I have to, they don't, you don't necessarily have to keep your kid in the local public school. You can, you know, go to a charter school that may be more aligns with what you, with the, your type of edu educational experience um, that, you, um, that you would like. Now, what is the performance of charter schools relative to public schools? Last I looked at the literature, it is, you know, essentially there are great charter schools and there are bad charter schools. So overall, there may be, I think the last time I looked, there's slight positive that they do slightly better than public schools, but there is a wide range of outcomes. There are absolutely horrible charter schools that don't do much and are probably worse, way worse. I mean, my, uh, when I volunteered with Big Brothers, my little brother Marquise, he went to one that was terrible with like the principal ran off with like all the school's funding, like literally ran off to Mexico um, and the school had no money. Um, and there are great charter schools. There are, you know, the, the Success Academy in New York um, that is achieving incredible outcomes um, with, with very low income students. Um, so, you know, it depends. Some good charter schools, uh, some, uh, some bad charter schools. We're not gonna get into it. Uh, in depth in this class. We're just primarily looking at what determines the quality of local, uh, uh, the local public school. All right, that is that.